The Brookings Institution. The Brookings Institution was established by St. Louis tycoon and philanthropist, Robert Summers Brookings, 1850-1932. At the age of 21, Brookings had become a partner in Couples and Marston, a manufacturer of woodenware and cordage, which, 10 years later, under his leadership, expanded and flourished. In 1896, at the age of 46, he retired to devote his duties towards higher education, and became president of Washington University's Board of Trustees, which, through the next 20 years, turned into a major university. He was one of the original trustees of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and a consultant to the Commission on Economy and Efficiency during the Taft administration. In 1917, he was appointed to President Wilson's War Industries Board, which had the responsibility of receiving and distributing the supplies needed by the military, later becoming chairman of its price-fixing committee, responsible for negotiating prices for all goods purchased by the Allied governments, which gave him a key role in the Wilson administration. At the age of 70, he took over the leadership of the Institute for Government Research, IGR, founded by lawyer and economist Frederick A. Cleveland in 1916, and raised $750,000 from 92 corporations and a dozen private citizens, to get it moving. Their first project was to push for legislation creating a federal budget, which was successful. The first U.S. budget director, under President Harding, was Charles G. Dawes, who relied heavily on the IGR staff. The Institute was also involved in civil service reform legislation in the 1920s. Among their members, Supreme Court Chief Justice William Howard Taft, who was Chief Justice from 1921-30, after his presidential term, Herbert Hoover, President, 1929-32, and Elihu Root. Brookings decided that economics was the biggest issue, and not the administrative aspects that the Institute was covering, so in June, 1922, with a $1,650,000 grant from the Carnegie Corporation, he established the Institute of Economics to represent the interests of the labor unions and the general public. In 1924, he established the Robert S. Brookings School of Economics and Government, an outgrowth of Washington University in St. Louis, to allow doctoral students to spend time in Washington, D.C., to work on the staffs of the IGR and the Institute of Economics. In 1927, he merged all three organizations to form the Brookings Institution, whose purpose was to train future government officials. He put $6 million, and 36 years of his life, into the nonpartisan, nonprofit center, which analyze government problems, and issue statistical reports. They produce an annual report, setting national priorities, which analyze the president's budget. Their headquarters is an eight-story building, eight blocks from the White House, at 1775 Massachusetts Avenue, Northwest. They have a staff of about 250, including about 45 senior fellows and 19 research associates. Salaries go as high as $40,000 a year. After serving close to 10 years in the State Department, Leo Pozvolsky returned to the Brookings Institution in 1946, along with six other members of the State Department. With the financial backing of the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation, and the Mellon Trust, Pozvolsky initiated an international studies group, which developed the basis for the Marshall Plan, to aid the European war recovery efforts. In 1951, the Chicago Tribune said that the Brookings Institution had created an elaborate program of training and indoctrination in global thinking, and that most of its scholars wind up as policy makers in the State Department. Truman was the first president to turn to them for help. In 1941, he named Brookings Vice President Edwin Noose as the first chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Kennedy and Johnson appointed many of their members to key posts. Carter's foreign policy became a resting place for the many of the group's recommendations. President Johnson said that the purpose of his Great Society legislation was to try to take all of the money that we think is unnecessarily being spent and take it from the haves and give it to the have-nots that need it so much. Quat. Ralph Epperson, author of The Unseen Hand, one of the best books about the master conspiracy, said that Johnson was a closet communist. Quat. Another well-known researcher, John Coleman, said that the Brookings Institute had developed and drafted the Great Society programs which were in every detail, simply lifted from Fabian socialist papers drawn up in England. In some instances, Brookings did not even bother to change the titles of the Fabian Society papers. One such instance was using Great Society, which was taken directly from a Fabian socialist paper from the same title. Quat. After socialist leader Eugene Debs died in 1926, socialist Norman Thomas, who graduated from and was ordained by the Union Theological Seminary, became the leader of the Socialist Party, running for president six times. Thomas was happy with Johnson's vision and said, I ought to rejoice and I do. I rub my eyes in amazement and surprise. His war on poverty is a socialistic approach. Quat. Republicans regard the institution as the democratic government in exile, yet, Nixon appointed Herbert Stein, a Brookings scholar, to be chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. The Nixon administration, 
who at one time had considered bombing the Brookings Institution, in order to allow the FBI to seize their documents, had considered the idea of a Brookings Institution for Republicans, to offset the liberalism of Brookings. They thought of calling it the Institute for an Informed America, or the Silent Majority Institute. E. Howard Hunt, of Watergate fame, was to be its first director, but he wanted to turn it into a center for covert political activity. The role of the conservative Brookings was taken by an existing research center called the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research, which was founded in 1943 by Louis H. Brown, chairman of the board at Johns Manville Corporation, to promote free enterprise ideas. During the early 60s, they shortened their name to the American Enterprise Institute, and later received a lot of financial support during the Nixon and Ford administrations, when the organization became a pool from which they drew their advisors. When Carter was elected, the IA became a haven for many Republican officials, including President Gerald Ford, and William E. Simon, the Secretary of Treasury. The Committee for Economic Development in 1941, Paul Gray Hoffman, President of the Studebaker Company, and a trustee of the University of Chicago, along with Robert Maynard Hutchins, and William Benton, the university's president and vice president, organized the American Policy Commission to apply the work of the university's scholars and economists to government policy. They later merged with an organization established in 1939 by Fortune magazine, called Fortune Roundtable. Starting out as a group of business, labor, agricultural, and religious leaders, they soon evolved into an establishment organization, with such members as, Ralph McCabe, head of Scott Paper Company, Henry Luce, editor-in-chief and co-founder of Time, Life, and Fortune magazines, Ralph Flanders, a Boston banker, Marshall Field, Chicago newspaper publisher, Clarence Francis, head of General Foods, Ray Rubicum, an advertising representative, and Beardsley Rummel, treasurer of Macy's department store in New York City, former dean of social sciences at the University of Chicago, and chairman of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, whose idea it was to deduct taxes from your paycheck. At the beginning of World War II, Hoffman and Benton approached Jesse Jones, the Secretary of Commerce, with an idea for an American policy commission to analyze, criticize, and challenge the thinking and policies of business, labor, agriculture, and government, which Jones accepted, and began to organize, with their help. On September 3, 1942, the Committee for Economic Development was incorporated in Washington, D.C., 2000 Leader Street NW, Suite 700, 2, to foster, promote, conduct, encourage, and finance scientific research, education, training, and publication in the broad field of economics in order that industry and commerce may be in a position, in the post-war period, to make their full contribution to high and secure standards of living for people in all walks of life through maximum employment and high productivity in our domestic economy, to promote and carry out these objects, purposes, and principles in a free society without regard to, and independently of the special interests of any group in the body politic, either political, social, or economic. Quat. Basically, their work centered around how to prepare the U.S. economy for a smooth transition from a wartime to a peacetime environment without the occurrence of a major depression or recession. A 1944 said report, International Trade and Domestic Employment, by Duke University professor Calvin B. Hoover, helped push the United States into the International Monetary Fund, which was laid out at the Bretton Woods Conference in June, 1944, by chief negotiators Harry Dexter White, of the CFR, and John Maynard Keynes, of the Fabian Society, and the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, World Bank, which both became part of the United Nations. It also helped motivate establishment backing for what later emerged as the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. About three years later, their report on an American program of European economic cooperation was eventually developed into the strategy for European recovery that became part of the Marshall Plan. In fact, Hoffman, who became the first said chairman, later headed the federal agency that administered the Marshall Plan. After the war, while Hoover was on leave from Duke, he worked with Hoffman to develop what eventually became known as the Marshall Plan. The group's later work laid the groundwork for regional government in the United States.